So uh, this morning as, as we have gathered, we are all uh, very well of aware whether you actually, let me, how many actually still get the newspaper? Yeah, well, <laughs> I just had to call you. I think that's just amazing. And uh, so I had to actually go and, go and buy one because I haven't actually physically held one of these in quite a while, and it actually felt really good. It was like something other than the digital screen, but then I realized my hands were completely dirty. So, but at least, uh, at least with these compared to digital screens, we can see the dirt, right? Um, we are uh, in, a, in a time in history that is obvious, whether you are young to the eldest, very well aware uh, that current events happening all around us globally are uh, challenge us and whether we're believers or those that maybe have, have yet to make a profession of faith struggle with how is it that I'm going to interpret the news, <laughs> right? And I mentioned this quote in the, uh, in the, uh, my, in the e-news earlier this week from uh, Carl Barth from over 100 years ago. Uh, that he challenged a bunch of preachers. He said, take your, uh, take your Bible, take your newspaper, read both, but here's the key. Let the Bible interpret the newspapers, right? And that, is, that, that could be said flippantly, but my, my, my so longing, and I, I know the, the group that I'm with today and even many of those that are online, I, I, I know you know this, so this is not new information. But I do find something in Scripture interesting in terms of how often Scripture repeats itself, which tells me something. I need to hear it more than once. We need to hear it more than once. There's a reason when certain things in Scripture get repeated over and over and over again. Uh, we used to think that the, the hardest part of... Uh, being a, a pastor, or even as, a, as believers, was to interpret how to, how to interpret the Bible. But it is worth asking the question, especially when we're faced with the kind of news that seems to be streaming, literally, digitally and, and otherwise, but just the current events, how is it that we're going to interpret the reality of the news? I just would say a couple other very simple things here. Um, our current events... Uh, I, I believe firmly they're only confirming what any uh, survey reader of the Bible or cliff notes, and nobody uses cliff notes ever, right? Even a, a cliff notes reader of the Bible would know this, is likely aware, we are no longer, hear me on this, we're no longer waiting for the end of the end. Um, it, the end, um, I just, I, I, again, I don't think this is news to anybody. I'm not making news this morning. The end has begun. And there is a reality that we should be reminded that though 2,000 years ago, uh, this was true. We're going to look at that from Scripture. Um, though it, the end had begun 2,000 years ago, we have now at a time in history where we are seeing the escalation point from that point of history to where we are now, from where Jesus, where all of scriptures had spoken that the end would come, as we often would say, we're, the end is nearer now, right? I mean, you just work the timeline. Uh, and that's where we are in history. So my, my goal this morning, um, in fact, I, I, just, I just caught myself in, in my preparations. Uh, certainly one of my goals is to convince anybody that would endure my messages, uh, that would be in the house today listening, that you would be convinced of this fact, that we are at the end of the end. And that's just our reality. So, but I, I, think, I think most everybody's 
pretty convinced on that, so I'm not going to need to spend a little, lot of time on that. Um, but what I think deserves important time is to offer guidance on what we're going to do in response to that fact. And that's what I'm going to spend some time this Sunday and, and we'll likely roll into next Sunday. I'm just to say this on the front end too. This is not a message that is going that should generate fear. Okay, uh, if it does, we're actually we'll talk about that even towards the end. But but for believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, uh, talking about the end of the days is not a time to be fearful. Uh, it is it's a joyful expectation. Yeah, um, I've been faithfully uh, reading scriptures. Probably <laughs> happy to know that your pastor does that. Um, but I also am very well aware of the news. And, um, but I refuse uh, to preach the news. Right? You know what I'm saying on that? I mean, I, there's just a thing there. We're going to preach Jesus and Him crucified. Amen. So I'm inviting us to join the command of Jesus this morning, which is these words. He sat with his disciples, it's a passage we'll again look at, that he gave to the disciples amidst really what was during their time their own tribulation. He says these words, look, I tell you, lift up your, your eyes and, and, and see the fields that are white for harvest. It was an invitation that he made and I believe at this time in history, Again, this is one that every one of us should be embracing the words of Jesus. Look, help me out with it one more time. I tell you what, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Turn with me, Gospel of John. We're just going to read a couple of the verses here very quickly in order to get into, uh, we'll just chance to unpack this. John 4, I invite you to stand. We'll have it on the screen, but... Uh, this would be a passage in the middle of Jesus' engagement. It's a great story of ministering to the Samaritan woman. Some of you may be familiar with it, but we're, we're going to step in to the moment where the disciples who had left to get takeout come back, anticipating that they would have food and eat with Jesus. The woman that Jesus had ministered to already steps away. Verse 31 He's now with his disciples. They were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. And he said to them, uh, actually, let me have you repeat this one. He said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to him, again, I'd invite you to read with me. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say that there are four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, join me please, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. The next word, please, already, already, already. This was 2,000 years ago, right? He says, already the one who reaps is receiving wages, gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have, you've, you've entered into their labor. And this is again the invitation uh, that we have today in 2021. Bow your hearts please. Father God, I, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Already, the, the spirit, the climate, the attitude that we've been able to enjoy in your presence today. And Lord, as we go to your word and as we continue to just navigate uh, in this life according to your word, I pray that every hearer today, including myself, would be ever convinced that the end of the end has begun. And that is not going to birth fear in any heart 
I'm asking, Holy Spirit, please guard our hearts in this hour. And then the other part, I'm asking you folks to pray for me. Father, please, will you help me to speak? Please, Lord, uh, touch the hot coals to my lips that I would speak. God, please, please help me um, to speak what is from your word. Uh, Give us a pure word today, please. We bow our hearts and we say yes and amen to his word. Amen. Bless you all. Thank you. I arrived in a little town called Baxter Springs, Kansas. Anybody from Baxter Springs? Not surprised. There was only about 500 people that are from there. Um, It was at a time when I had been just begun traveling with, uh, with my buddy, and we had been ministering for uh, kids and youth family rallies and man being a I guess I was 20 so this is 21 or so and had such zeal just anticipating every opportunity you could to preach the gospel and God had opened up some fantastic doors much of which started originally because of my dad's uh, ministry nationally and and uh, so they let the kid come in and hey and we were up and going, but early on and at this point, um, you'd, you'd, get a, you'd get called and you'd get something scheduled, and inevitably, somebody would, would cancel. The problem was you had already been driving there, you know, and we were in Virginia, and so it was during a very, it happened to be a very difficult time. We had a couple cancellations, but we had this one church in Baxter Springs, Kansas, that was on our list. We had, we were really looking forward to to cities like uh, Miami, Florida, Los Angeles, and Seattle. We got called to Baxter Springs, Kansas. You know, right? And we drive, uh, we pull up, and, and uh, the hotel, we drive in on a Saturday, and it, the, the, the whole town was in the middle of nowhere, but then the, the hotel that we were at, like it was, I didn't, couldn't tell between grandma's, house over here versus this hotel motel six would have looked like the hilton at this point so driving up and this was a humbling moment i like i remember the days you know nice anyways pulled up and and pack and get settled in sunday and i it might be a surprise to you at that age not now i had an attitude and uh oh wait i already prayed lord touch my lips Tell the truth. And complaining. Like, God, I want to I want to reach souls. I I got fire in my bones and I've got I I, I, you've given me a a vision for my my, the ministry you've called me to, and and I'm stuck here in Baxter Springs, Kansas, and this just infested little hotel room. And uh, anyways, open the door, the back of the it, which is weird, it, the, the hotel room had a back door, which that in itself will tell you something. But I opened up, I opened up, and I kid you not, this isn't the exact picture, but it looks, it looked a lot like this. As far as my eye could see was this amazing, amazing wheat field. And it was really up against harvest time. It looked almost like that. And by the way, you know when it says white under harvest, and there's a couple theories on that when Jesus is talking, but one of it is those that, Sharon, you probably know this with, with uh, the Midwest, when the, when the sun hits the wheat, when it's at this, at a certain, just a certain angle, it's just white. Yeah, when the sun shines, S-O-N. I uh, sat in this little chair, just sat outside, and... and uh, just humble, just considering what this looked like now that was in front of me. The Lord had placed me here. Um, there was a simple word that, that came to my heart that became a, an, an impact to me. And it was simply these words. Just stay faithful in the field. That was the word the Lord had just nested in my heart. Um, stay faithful in the field. Um, ended up, we had a Beautiful crusades and ministry at this little, sweet little church. Um, stage was 
probably just not even this. And we had all this gear. We had these huge trailers with all this. Again, probably surprising to you that we had all this stuff, right? But we crammed it in and preached the gospel and had a, had a couple nights there. I'll, I'll share the rest of it with you in a little bit. But I just want to say that word, mind us all of this word today. Stay faithful in the field. That really is because we, we know 2,000 years ago it was ready. It's now 2,000 years later. It's like way ready. And as we've been talking, uh, God has, has been moving. There's been reaping, obviously, for previous generations and where we are now. Just reminding you, the disciples, remember, they, they, were, they were Hebrews themselves. So they had been trained of Hebrew prophecy. They were well aware that there would be a time of a great harvest, and it would be this declaration that it's begun. Jesus, in his words, they would come to mind that the harvest, the eternal harvest, that the prophet Joel and all throughout history had spoken of would come. That there would be a time when God himself would gather to him persons, souls, both alive and, and dead. There would be a, a similar to the restoration of Israel, though, uh, the disciples didn't seem to have a complete understanding of how this harvest was going to look like. They perhaps maybe likely assumed that it was just the Israel people, Jewish people, ethnic Israel. Um, they anticipated that there would be a single event, I, I think is very likely based on what we see of the disciples. There was just going to be this one time, it's going to be a one and done. Um, Jesus now, opening their eyes, gives them and offers them a more complete view, doesn't he? There would be a more complete view of the harvest prophecy was that it would have a beginning and it would progressively move towards the final great harvest. And so again, I say, the end of the end has begun because there is a final a great harvest. Jesus was, was helping them to understand, and, and certainly other conversations that Jesus will have and other parables, that the world, that there would be a time when the world would experience a heightened awareness of God's presence, because he was going to pour out his spirit, right? How many know that God's already poured out his spirit on all flesh, and the sons and daughters, right? And it goes. We're in that stage. Everybody knows that, right? We're in that time of grace. But that there be a heightened, and that was a, a very encouraging word. God's presence would be heightened. They would, they would, the gospel would be spread out, and there would be this incredible, as it were, harvest, progressively, in many senses. But juxtapose, up against this, there would be a deception in the world that would also be heightened. And that that deception would especially exist and, as it were, haunt God's people. Um, there would be great persecution, a heightened persecution against God's people. That as it progressed, this is what would happen. It's always been persecution, but it would be increased. They said Jesus was making sure that they understood. Darkness would increase as would the brightness of the light of Jesus Christ. Nobody's left yet. Good. So this means, just summarizing the facts here, that it would be a season that would be both grim and glorious. Increasingly so. Increasingly grim increasingly glorious yeah there would be great hope and in reality there'd be great despair when Jesus had spoken these words likely the disciples would have known from Joel 3 um, the prophecy from 700 plus years before put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe go in tread for the wine press is full the vats overflow for the their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes. And this is what the prophet was seeing at a time that would be in the valley. What is that word? Valley of decision. Boy, interesting. For the Lord, day of the Lord is near. 
Where? In the valley of decision. Jesus confirms this ancient prophecy. And in approximately what would have been the time, track with me please, A.D. 35, he announced that the harvest has what? Has begun. Likely, from the disciples' perspectives, this was good news. I mean, put yourself, as we're supposed to do when we read Scripture, the first hearers, what are they hearing? Yeah? They would think, well, this is great. Because after all, we're good wheat. Right? They're with Jesus. But of course, Jesus was opening their eyes. He was showing them that in distance, remember, this is in the Samaritan field. And those the Jews, you know, want anything to do with them. So an awareness that that harvest is going to include them. It's going to include Gentiles. And, and, and if, if, if um, the, the disciples could have opened their eyes far enough, they would see into a, an America, right? Into a a global universe of people, literally right now, seven billion people in the world today. That everyone who believed and worshipped the Messiah as Savior and Lord would be the good wheat gathered into the Father's house. Of course, we know this. I don't know how many... I, I so was a city boy, so farming, you know, I've just had to learn and glean, but I have honestly been fascinated by it, and I've always, is this right, I was, as a kid, I insist we had to have a garden, and I had, um, and spent thousands of dollars, I'm sure, over the years, it would have been way cheaper to buy sprouts, um, a whole store, it would have been just cheaper for me. But I just am fascinated, so I really appreciate the metaphor, right? So if a farmer would know a couple things, right, regarding a harvest. That there was, first of all, that they would have in any harvest, there would be a mix of both wheat and weeds. It would just be the reality. But that wheat and weeds, at some point, after it's harvested, would need to be separated, right? Um, but that would happen after the, the harvest was complete frustrating thing to farmers, right? Dad, gum those weeds. Yeah. But it's just a reality in nature. And then we see that in nature, and Jesus' scriptures connects the dots that this is the way it would work. Jesus explains this in other words. Matthew 13 really says it. The parable that he unpacks, and it literally explains. The field is the word. The good seed is the son of the kingdom. The weeds are the son of the evil one. Um, so, just a reality, when we're thinking harvest, we're thinking, okay, there's weeds and there's wheat, which kind of moves us to the thinking, which one am I, you know? Like, the other thing the farmer would understand about the harvest, when reaping begins, it would re represent a finality to the growth of whatever's planted. True? Like, you think about that. You cut that sucker down, that is not growing anymore, right? It is one, at that moment, it's one and done. Um, whatever was planted, however it grew, that's it. So that's the harvest. Simple. We're now 2,000 years since that announcement. We're in an age of grace. We're in incredible opportunities for persons to come to faith. Like everything that was talked about, we're seeing. But there still remains a couple of things we don't know. These are obvious too. We don't know how much is left to be harvested. True. Um, which means we don't know how much longer the world has until the reaping is complete. We're all on the same page of that, right? We are not, you are not going to know the date. And if you come up and tell me that you know the date, I'm going to be like. And if you're listening to any preachers telling you when the dates are, you can turn them off. I'm telling you, it's not healthy. Um, the only, what we have in the word of God, please, young eldest 
new in the Lord, um, the news, um, fascinating and interesting and shocking and irritating and irritating and maddening and irritating, did I already say irritating, um, as it is, uh, Scripture, the Word of God is the, the only interpretation for the news today. And I'm just going to walk a fine line here on this. Prophets, New Testament prophets, so any of the gift of prophecy that happens today is not given the responsibility. Scripture does not allow for prophets to tell what time it is. Only Scripture tells us what time it is. So any prophets that are like, you, or you're depending on what the prophets are saying that way, honestly, as, as blessed as that gift is, it is not for that purpose. Okay? There's, there's, there's other, and we've talked about that, but um, we just need, a, we need, we need solid, solid Scripture to guide us through this. So all that to say, this may be a point, it is true. I mean, come on, who's not curious about the return of Christ when that's going to happen, like, right? And, it, and, it's, and it's fun to have conversations of a conjecture that like, man, it's like these stars are lining up and you're like, yeah, but there's this reality and we know it's become why. The question comes back, why does Scripture keep saying over and over and over again about the, the end of the days when it's so far off. You know, that was thousands of years ago. Um, true on the following statement. Information is a gift. But it can be a curse when it's false. It's a gift when it's true. A curse when it's false. Today's news yeah, that's the deal, right? Hmm, what do we do with that? Scripture keeps giving us heads up about the last days. Um, but if it's not telling us the date, then what are we to do with it? What should we make of this information? How should it change our life? Let me just ask you some questions here. Think about this, please, and a little bit of contemplation. If we know that the, the end of the age, the end of the days is near, it has begun, like it's here, what should we do with it? How, how's it going to change our life? Like, how do we, how's it going to change our relationships? How are we going to, parents, hear me, how, how does it change our parenting, right? How does, um, how does that affect our finances, how we steward our time? How, how much should we participate? Here's another one. How much should we participate in the systems of this world that is not just so much secular but is directly influenced by what John refers to as the spirit of the Antichrist? Like, like seriously, like if we believe right now this is the end of the end, how should that affect things? Yeah? I would offer a summary here that has been consistent. It would be, you might even call it kind of orthodox among a consensus of of the great theologians of the year, that at the very minimum, these three things should be understood by it. One is this, that these verses, these scriptures about the end days, is first to bring about an awareness that we should have our eyes wide open to know what is happening around you. And if we're not, so that's why it is not okay to just ignore the news. Yeah? So you say, well, I just don't even want to listen to it. And I, I understand, trust me, there's a line, which is, we'll talk about the wisdom. History has proven, even among the church, she has not done well when she has sought to ignore the realities of the rest of the world, the news, the current events that are happening. Bad things have happened when the church is ignorant. So an awareness. He says, okay, we're going to bring an awareness. That's one of the reasons. 
Um, the other one is soberness. How many are sober this morning? Please raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, I'm like, we're going to breathalyze her, but actually was thinking more. Okay, we got, look, looking good. Hallelujah. Yeah, there's no denial going on here. All right, first step. Um, soberness. And, and, and what's tied to soberness there is about finality. Like there's just a sense of what I said about the harvest thing. There's like it's one and done. This life, how many know that the death rate is 100%? Yeah? Except for the return of Christ, it's appointed. Yeah? Sober. Somebody nudge somebody next to you. Sober. Sober. All right. The, la- the, the third one that I, ca- that I best have, I've, I've understood and studied is that about a bringing a readiness. And here's the, please catch this, everyone. The readiness is, is a recognition, is based on a recognition that we are either wheat or we are weeds There might be a third category that's fair to say. People that are thinking about being a wheat. Or maybe have confessed, I'm going to be wheat. But they have yet to be born again. And repented. Turned to Christ. Received the gift of salvation. Because at the end of it all. There is either going to be wheat or weeds, tares. How are we doing so far? Everybody good? Everybody no? Are we in agreement, disagreement? We're like, we're good. Okay. So all of that has been said. Um, that we would have a baseline by which, and I just encourage you, if you're wondering when Scripture talks about things, These would be three things that should be... Did you notice what's not on the list? Fear. Are we in agreement on this? Just like check it. Are we in agreement that fear has been one of the great... I'm just going to use the word demons in our world today. And it is moving people to do stupid. Now, I didn't say be stupid. I don't want to do that because that's very impolite to call somebody stupid. And I will not do that while the recording is happening. So, um, my mom gave, taught me good manners. Turn with me real quick. Matthew 24. Just gonna, I'm going to give you a couple. We're just going to go to some of these end times. So, the, all of that's kind of just framing. We're just going to take a, a few more minutes with this. Um, how are we doing? All right. You guys doing all right? Because I, I just needed to say that. I'm like, I, I don't want to belabor. I just, it's, it's important that we understand that God's word defines and frames everything that is happening in this world. And that should be one of the passions of why we study Scripture, why we want to get a hold of true and truth and understanding. Matthew 24, one of Jesus' descriptions. Here he's saying, it's, it's, man, you just, like, these are the words of Jesus. Look at this. He's like, man, the, it's like, it, it's from a surface, it could be scary. It says, so he's having this, dialogue no one no one uh he said there's going to be times that there's people are going to claim to to be christ they're going to try and lead you away this is going to happen he's telling that remember he's, remember this escalation thing this is where he's referenced there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and take place and all this all this is going to be happening um but look in verse 12 look down at verse 12 and he gives the warning and because um Lawlessness will be increased. The love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be politically saved. 
and have financial prosperity no matter what happens as long as you claim hold of... It's not... I guess they call that eisegesis. You read stuff into Scripture, right? I guess that's what that was. But, verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And the end, and the end will come. So I'm, I'm, I mentioned this one, and, and really you could just look at it. Um, it is bringing about an awareness. Let's check that off. Did it bring an awareness? Cause us to look around. Did it, it pointed to that. Look, there's going to be wars. You're going to see it. When you see that, that's like something. You beware. Um, did it bring a soberness? Like, like, hello. Yeah. Yes. And then it also brought with that, that that sense of urgency that says, get ready. Get ready. Um, so I, I asked the question, what does this mean? What is it going to do? How are we going to do life different as a result? So you just read, you listened to the words of who? We Did everyone hear the words of Jesus, right? Like that's a big deal. So what are we going to do about it? What is that, what's that supposed to look like? Let me offer up one of them. Just one of the statements. As a result of, in a practicality, I believe one of the things that would spur on in us is the call that we hear throughout the rest of the New Testament. Be continually full of the Spirit. So to, to be able to discern every false spirit that is going to come our way. Because we know it's going to happen. The only way to be able to discern what is true and what is not is going to be by the Spirit of God. Anybody in agreement with that? There is, there is no amount of research, as important, we'll talk about that, no amount of research that's going to be able to help us discern the choices, the things that we're faced with in life without the Holy Spirit. So some might ask, why are we spending so much time just sitting in the presence of God? Why is prayer meeting so important? Why is all of this connected to the fact of an invitation from God that we would be a people at a time like this full of the Spirit of the Lord? We got four amens. That's all right. That's seed. That's good seed. Revelations 13. We're just not going to get through this list. I'm just going to give it to you. A couple of them here. We'll take more next week. Revelation 13. This is just asking. Here's, here's another one. Uh, verse 9 and 10. If anyone, he's talking, about the, he's talking about the coming of the beast, the end of the, end of the age, and that this would happen, which, um, man, we are so not going to get into the, the debate on the timing of this. I would just say to you, in one form or another, the beast is is already here in one, at the very least in one sense. And in fact, he says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity goes. If anyone's to be slain with a sword, with a sword, must he be slain? Like, wow, is that not sober? He says, here is a call, what? For the endurance and what? Faith of the saints. Still, fear does not show up here for the saints. Endurance and faith. Why? And so here's one of my encouragements with this. And it's, again, consistent with the rest of Scripture. Be encouraged by reading and studying and talking about and imagining the return of Christ Jesus. Like in a time like this, and I think that's part of what's happening here, is this, this challenge. If anyone is to... To be taken captive, and like these are awarenesses, things that you would become aware of when you see it. This is a call. He's trying to accomplish something with his word. And I think in a time like this, we need to be pondering what Scripture says about the return of Christ as encouragement. Because the word endurance um, is not just a, a um, or even the word encouragement, I should say, is not just about, hey, don't you feel better? 
It's about strengthening, like creating a resolve. Like, we need that. How many need that, like, right now? Like, it is so tempting to be discouraged right now because the world is, it is, it's just bad. Again, I don't need to walk through it. It is bad, 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 bad. Um, so we need, how we're going to be strengthened. What was, what was scripture intend for us to do? That we would be built up pondering. So we would encourage each others with these words, which is what? Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. We said, well, that's been the case for 2,000 years. I'm telling you the good news right now that we are nearer to that moment than any other time in history. <laughs> He's coming back. Well, do we really need to talk about that? Yes, yes, yes. Not for the purposes of escape. So I just forget about, oh, wait, because there's this piece that we're in, right? Look at this monitor over here for me for a moment. Jesus came 2,000 years ago as Messiah, right? God incarnate, fully God and fully man. Somebody say hallelujah for the coming of Christ, right? He's coming back again. The parousia. He's coming in all of his glory. We stand between this moment but we look to this moment because in this space, I need to know that this is going to work out really good in the end. Yeah. I think we might be spending more time listening to the news than we are listening to the hope of the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, if you do, your soul will pay the price. I'm going to leave us with this last one, and then we'll... we'll... Revelation 13, 18 says this. So he's, he's, again, he's lots of words, lots of talk about the end. Verse 18 says, this, he's talking about the mark of the beast and all of that happening. He said, this calls for what? That is, the, that is called anti-stupid. Yeah? Except it's not the wisdom of man, it's the wisdom of God. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Again, this is this, this awareness piece. So I say to us, let the wisdom of God direct your choices. Folks, what Christians can do better than anything right now is to be rational, logical in one sense. Do your research. Folks, vaccine, no vaccine. Folks, please, please, please. We are living in a time where there is incredible amount of false information. And the truth is, it is on the whole spectrum. It is on both sides of it. And you have, we have to do our job at a time where we can't trust science. We can't trust, we, I was going to say attorneys, but that's not the point. Um, we can't trust politicians. We can't trust the economy. You know, we say, well, who are we going to trust? Trust Jesus. Like, so I say, okay, I'm going to trust Jesus, but I still have to make decisions. How do I navigate in a, in a world where a government is telling me how to do and make medical decisions for me and all of that stuff? What does that look like, folks? It is a time by which we are told that the thing that should trigger in us is a call for wisdom. And how beautiful it is. Man, if you are curious how to navigate through a socialist society and how to, how to figure out all these things in, in, in the world, just spend some time in Proverbs. The amount of wisdom that tells you how to live your life with or without an oppressive government is abundantly clear. That's why we're not fearful. Because there's real answers. There's real answers would you close your eyes with me for just a second? I'm going to just repeat with this one more time, just in the ponderings. That we would be continually full of the Spirit to discern every false spirit. If you would agree with that, would you say amen? Like, I need that. I need the full of the Spirit. That I would be encouraged by reading Scripture, talking about and imagining the return of Christ Jesus. Amen?
that we would, as a response to Scripture, that we would let the wisdom of God direct our choices. Um, one of my concerns, get your attention again. Um, one of my concerns with regard to interpretation of the end times doctrines is the tendency to base it on what's happening in America. It's, and that's been a problem in the last 75 years. We're like, everything's, what's happening in America? Like, we have a whole world, and most of that world has governments that's been telling it what to do, its citizens what to do and how to do it. And it should not be surprising, but maybe it is, that some of the most exciting churches in the world, the most prosperous, are in nations and cities that are incredibly oppressive governments. So that just says, yay, church of the living God. Yeah? So right... Because if we, if we ignore how the rest of the world has been experiencing decades or centuries of oppressive government and persecution of Christ followers. I mean, listen, folks, you've heard me say this. India has had a religious identification card for decades. You sign up. You're told if you're a Christian, it gets labeled. It's a different color card, like literally. Um, especially in the Andhra Pradesh where, where many of our pastors are. And... They have been dealing with they can't get jobs, they can't buy and sell. So that's why I say in one sense, the mark of the beast, like in one sense is, is it, yep. If you want to know how to navigate it, just talk to them. All right, Joe, we've, we've, we were down there. So, yes, there's always been famine, pestilence, poverty, government tyranny, sexual immorality and perversions and persecution. And now, but interesting, all of this and more is happening at these heightened levels. So with a global awareness of the news, Jesus wants us to know that the end is near, nearer than ever, and that we as his body should be full of hopeful expectation of his return. I don't believe that we are called to be fatalists. That we should just accept whatever's going to happen in our government's going to happen. I think we need to stand for righteousness. Like seriously. But here's the point with it. When we're going to stand for righteousness, make sure we stand for all of it. So if we're going to stand for the unborn child, we at the same time have to stand for the women that have been oppressed and abused and mutilated. We stand for the full spectrum of the oppressed. That is the call, maybe not of a government party, but it is part of being children of the Most High God. Yeah? So, at a time like this, am I okay? Are you, yeah, I couldn't tell whether you guys are about to attack me. All right, because they look tough. Um, that would say, since the end is near, our primary mandate is ultimately clear, to bring glory to God. Stand with me, folks. Our ultimate mandate is to bring glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Are we in agreement on that? Like out of everything we're called, that doesn't mean we ignore all the other. Doesn't mean we just, we, we step aside and let it happen. But I'm saying for the church of the living God, bring glory and glory and glory and glory to the King of Kings. And that's our greatest passion. Amen? It's to participate right now in the reaping of the souls that are already ready for the harvest. And this means the things we should most matter in us, with us, likely are not the things um, that maybe we worry so much about. My there used to be a trend early on when talking about end times. And it put the fear of God in me. You've been left behind. Remember that one? Like, I don't know how many times I made it to the altars as a result of that book. You know? In those books. 
But I wonder if a more consistent message of the gospel is still, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields that are white for harvest. Can I go back to that picture one more time? An amazing wheat field in Baxter Springs, Kansas. It was a beautiful service. The Lord spoke that word to me. That Tuesday morning, we got a call in this little Baxter Springs, Kansas. We got a call from the principal of the local school and said, would you guys be interested in doing a show for all of our kids and all of our high school, um, all, the, whole, the whole school, which is Baxter Springs, Kansas, they're like 30, and said, sure. So we show up, and we ended up with 700 kids. And, and the principal said, you're going to invite everybody to the, to the kids' crusade, to the rally at, at night, aren't you? And I'm like, well, this is a public school. They need Jesus. We ended up that Tuesday night packing out that place. And I'm just saying, be faithful in the field. Like, that became an open, we ended up, over the course of another four years, speaking to over 100,000 kids throughout the country. And it started there in Baxter Springs, Kansas, with me having a really poopy attitude that God took and redeemed it and moved me from a thinking that this is bad to a knowing that this is good. To God be all the glory in the here and now and for all the centuries and the forever to come. Father God, thank you. Lord, this hour in your word, Lord, we love you. We take your Bible. We take the word that you've given us. And we take the newspaper. We take the news. Lord, we're going to be aware of what's happening in this world. But forever, Lord, may your word be the thing that we sing about, that we talk about, that we proclaim, that we know that your word is the final word on all that is happening around us. Lord, help us. Help us respond as your kids as we stand here this hour and say we're getting ready. Come on, church. Just want to begin to talk about it. Talk about it to the Lord. Lord, we anticipate your return. Lord, open up our imaginations. Yeah. Can we sing about it just one more time? Lord, thank you, God. You are stirring up faith within us, Lord. Let it be, Lord. You. Lord Jesus. Take a deep breath with that reality. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Lord Jesus. We sing to the one who has come and who is coming again for his bride. Today I bless you. I thank you for worshiping so freely this morning. I bless you that you would be encouraged in your faith you would be strengthened with the reality of God's love for you. I bless you with a hopeful expectation that infects every thought that you would have, every action you would make in order that your life would forever bring glory to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Church family, I bless you online and in person in the name of the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit, once again, church, to God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We love you, folks. God bless you. We're available if we need prayer. Have a great day in the Lord.